In our previous tutorial, we discussed component placement and critical routing. We selected an 8 mil track width and spacing for the differential pair, but this needs to be done in a proper way, according to the stack up that contains certain requirements like impedance, number of layers, thickness of the PCB, etc. Depending on these requirements, you can generate a stack up. You can see in this stack up a 90 ohm impedance on the top layer one and layer four. These top green parts represent the solder mask. This is the top solder mask and this is the bottom solder mask. This is layer four and this is layer one. The yellow part represents the core and the green part, the prepreg. This half ounce copper foil comes with a half ounce plating. So total will be one ounce. These outer layers are one ounce and the required finish thickness is 62 mils. This is the total thickness of the board. And this is the estimated thickness of the lamination. So this has a tolerance of plus or minus 6.2. And uh, the top layer and bottom layer have a 90 ohm impedance and a differential line width of five mils. And you can see over here, the finished line width is five mils for layer one and for layer four, and the finished spacing is four mils. Uh, the differential pair width should be five mils and the spacing between the two tracks should be four mils. We have done the differential pair routing in the previous tutorial, so, so now we will start what we could call the critical routing. The first step is to place a plane on the layer three, which is the power plane. We need two types of power planes. One is the VCC, which is running over here, and the other is the plus 5V. You can see this line that is running all along this circuitry. Before proceeding, let's set the grid at 20 mils to make it easy to draw the plane. To draw a plane, select Add Filled Zones and click from where you want to start it. A window will pop up and we want to plane on layer three, which is power plane, and we want a plane of net VCC. We will select a chamfer of five mils and choose solid. We're drawing a plane in the left bottom side because the VCC is present in this section. We have to define plus 5V for the remaining area on the third layer. Select the power plane. This area is empty, so let's click over here. Select plus 5V on layer three. Make this chamfer five mils and choose solid pad connections. The planes are now set up for VCC and plus 5V. Let's route the main tracks, which are power tracks of 9V over here, and plus 5V that runs along the line to this point. This is the VCC point coming from the connector towards this point, and this one is the VCC running into the circuit. Select Add Filled Zones again. Draw a complete plane on the layer because this is just a 9V and it will be running only in this region. You don't have to draw a special plane on layer three. You can directly draw it on layer one. We are drawing a plane in this region because this is the power plane and it'll carry a high current. Similarly, we need to draw a plane for this plus 5V. There's a connection between this point and this point, but you can't see any line over here because we have created a plane on layer three and this is a through hole component. Through hole components normally connect to all the layers. Since there's a plane on layer three, these two are connected through layer three. This is a through hole that is going through layer three to the other point over here. It's always a good idea to have a plane because it improves the flow of the current. Let's talk about crystal. Crystal is basically a continuously varying signal 
which is required for any microcontroller to operate. It is used as a reference signal. This should be very close to the microcontroller and uh, its track should be as short as possible. We will route this line, select on the right hand side route tracks and mention 10 mils. You can go with 10 mils if the board's not too congested. If it's congested, then you can drop down to eight mils. Depending on your requirements, you can even drop down to six mils if you wanted to. First, let's do the routing of the critical nets. The crystal routing has to be as short as possible. As you can see, this line over here is the ground. The ground of the crystal should be connected to the nearest ground pin. You can place a via to connect it to the plane which also means that it will be connected to the ground. It is always better to connect these pins directly to the nearest ground pin. And in some high speed designs, you can follow the guard ring technique. There is one more connection over here, um, but we should avoid connecting a line through this. Since we have connected this line over here, we can place a plane so it could take this pin within the ground plane. Let's place it over here and select the ground plane on the top layer and choose solid. To place a via, click V on your keyboard. Place it on the board and choose cancel. Now the via is placed and will connect to the ground plane through the ground pins. First, we need to deal with the decoupling capacitors. You can see these are decoupling capacitors. Here, this plus five V comes from the regulator. And that track should go towards these pins through the capacitor, not directly through the 5V. Let's connect this top layer and have the 5V distributed through it. We can place a via over here. Now the plus 5V will come through the plane towards this capacitor through this via. And then it will go to the power plane. This is a power plane, VCC. And this is a capacitor. Select route tracks and connect this over here. So this plane is connected, but the VCC is still not connected and we have placed a plane on the layer. So we will take this one again and connect this. Click V and place it. Now cancel and OK. Now the connection will come through the VCC plane. Go through the capacitor. Now the connection will come through the VCC plane, go through the capacitor and go to the VCC. Every decoupling capacitor should be routed this way. The next step is to deal with the main pins. These are the control lines with which we can control operations. They will also give information about whether the data is available on the chip or not. These pins are connected here to these connectors. Normally we follow the orthogonal entry rule while routing on top and bottom layers. An orthogonal entry means that the top lines are at 90 degrees with respect to the bottom lines. Select the top layer, select this line and take a line from here. These are my eight data lines that are going to the IC and these pins should be connected to this connector. We actually need to move one of the tracks slightly away from the crystal zone. The data lines are connected and we need to connect these lines to this connector. Use the bottom layer, select the line, and select bottom. You can see these lines are running horizontally, but the top to bottom line is running vertically. This makes the routing very easy if you're routing different lengths on the top and bottom. Over here, slightly to the left, you can take this track straight up and put a via over here. We are demonstrating the principle of routing horizontally and vertically on different layers. This is the top layer, and this is the bottom layer. We will now show you how to do the entire routing. Let's go ahead and save this part first and close it. As you can see, this is a completed routing. You can see the planes. We have used a complete plane over here, which is connected through layer three. If you want, you could also have a plane over here on top. You can see this via over here that is coming from the plane through the capacitor and the pin. Same scenario over here. Now, let's have a look at the bottom lines. Here they are in green. 
Once the routing is completed, the next step is to make sure the designators don't overlap with the pairs. It's fine if they overlap with the tracks, but not the pairs. You can see at the bottom, there's a designator. And same over here. It is possible to place your ref text over your vias. They are tented, which means they will be covered with the solder mask, but it is always good practice to keep your ref text away from the pads as well as the vias. If it's not possible to keep it away from your vias, then tent your vias. To move the ref text, place the cursor on it, select it, and find a suitable place. If you place it over here, you can see that this line is a switch assembly line, so it will be covered on the assembly line. You need to select a proper place and make sure that the distance from the ref text is at least six mils from the pads. Right now, the ref text sizes are quite big. To change the size, go to Edit and the Edit Text and Graphic Properties. Select the Footprint References and select the layer. Here, the line thickness is six mils and the text width and height will be 30. The text thickness is also six. Now that the size is reduced, it's easier to do the placement. If you zoom in a bit, you'll see the white line on the footprints. If you can see this footprint on the right hand side, this is nothing but a place bound. It's always a good idea to keep the ref text outside of this place bound so there is no possibility of interfering with the actual pads. Let's complete the entire placing of the ref text before starting with the DRC checks. Make sure that all the ref texts are away from the pins. Once this is done, you need to start with the DRC checks, which are the rules that have been set up at the beginning. This will check whether those rules are being followed or not. So let's see how it works. Save this, go to Inspect and Design Rules Checker. This is the minimum track width as per the DRC. You can create a report file by clicking this box. Now click Run DRC. Since we have clicked the Create Report File box, we need to select a location to save this file. We'll save it as Report Files. Click Refill. Now the DRC tells us there are a few errors. Most of these errors will concern the differential lines. For instance, here it says two track ends too close. Right now, we don't have to worry about this because we have set a particular rule for the minimum distance between two tracks. All the errors are in this section. These are all known errors. Even if we knew this would happen, it is possible to avoid it. We can change the clearance to 10 mils and the spacing to 8 mils. The DRC is considering each track separately, and since the spacing is just 8 mils, it is actually not following the rule of 10 mils. That's why it's indicating there's an error, which can be ignored. If there are any errors in the DRC, solve them before going further.